Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to Digital Isle 2021. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm chair of Digital Isle of Man, which is an ex executive agency of the Department for Enterprise and a public-private partnership. It acts as a key uh, decision maker and advisory body for the economic prosperity of the sector. Digital Isle of Man was created to support the tech sector, developing and implementing strategy to support sustainable economic growth and establishing the Isle of Man as a center for international excellence for the digital economy. I've served on the Digital Isle of Man board since its creation in 2018 and this year I stepped up into the chair position. And I'm often asked why I got involved with the Digital Isle of Man. And the reason is actually very simple. The agency model is a smart move. It's the best opportunity I've seen in 30 years for industry to influence our economic strategy in a meaningful way. As industry, we live on the coalface. We know where the opportunities are and where government should be focusing its efforts. And we know the barriers that we need to push aside to grow our economy. And that's something that Digital Isle of Man has been designed to harness. And you only have to look at what's been delivered to see that it's working. Digital Isle of Man has put strategies in place that are creating many hundreds of new jobs in our sector. And that includes revitalizing our e-gaming strategy, which has created substantial growth in license numbers over the last three years. It's creating new initiatives in e-sports, in Internet of Things, in blockchain. And it's overseen major infrastructure projects, including the National Broadband Plan and the deployment of a new fiber optic cable to future-proof the island's connectivity to the rest of the world. It's established a digital literacy program which is available free of charge to help our community develop the important digital skills they need to find great jobs. And significantly, it's put account management processes in place to make sure that we're talking regularly to industry. And communication with industry is really what today is all about. You'll see digital board members around the conference today, and I'd encourage you to speak to them and give them plenty of feedback about your experiences so that we can make sure that we continue to deliver for our digital sector. My ambition as chair is to build momentum. I want to see a growing and vibrant digital economy that creates many new opportunities for our workforce, but importantly also for our next generation so that they can choose to live and thrive on our island. I'm very much looking forward to the day's sessions. We've got a really strong agenda today, covering a wide range of topics, and I hope that everybody enjoys the day. But enough from me, I'd like to invite the Minister for Enterprise, Dr. Alex Allenson, on stage to give the opening address for Digital Isle 2021. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Alex Allen, and it's a real pleasure um, to welcome you to the first Digital Isle event. The aim of today is to bring the island's great technology sector together to discuss the issues they face, um, both locally and globally. Now, Phil's already painted the picture of the agenda today and stole most of my speech, so I'll try to keep it brief and let you get on with the, um, with the agenda. A lot has happened since Digital Isle of Man was launched in May 2018. The island's e-gaming sector is thriving, with the Gambling Supervision Commission now supervising over 60 license holders, more than ever before, and existing businesses have expanded their operations. The ambition to deliver the blockchain sector on the island through the Digital Acceleration Programme has now got 47 affiliated businesses. Free access to an island-wide network has facilitated business and government to solve problems and create new applications in the Internet of Things space. And this has included the rollout of air quality monitors to all our schools with real-time data available to head teachers through an integrated dashboard. Initial interest in esports has been really positive, and work is already underway on a three year initiative to establish the Isle of Man as a hub for this global industry. 
and £11.5 million has been committed to the National Broadband, Broadband Plan, which commenced in 2020, and already over 50% of businesses have access to ultra-fast fibre. But the unprecedented last 18 months have been a real challenge for all of us. The global pandemic has turned the world upside down with lockdowns, restrictions and an economic downturn. As more people worked from home, they demanded better broadband. As teaching switched to online, pupils needed access to laptops. And as cinemas closed, the streaming of media blossomed. As we now emerge from those dark days, changes planned for years ahead have been accelerated with a new appreciation of the importance of our digital sector as an important and essential part of all of our lives. You empower businesses to grow and succeed, to diversify and find new markets. You empower individuals to learn, be entertained and progress their careers. We've seen a rapid shift in personal habits and attitudes, embracing new technologies, but also a convergence of digital, media, art and gaming to create a more complete future landscape. To build on this, there have been an increased focus on supporting the development of lifelong learning and the agency has recently launched its First Steps Digital Literacy Programme, offering 600 free places on two courses aimed to develop beginner or intermediate digital skills. Digital Isle of Man will also soon be launching a digital skills campaign in collaboration with our partners at Locate to attract skilled tech workers to our shores. The new administration has just launched the Draft Island Plan to further develop and strengthen our secure, vibrant and sustainable community. And the KPMG report will aim to use existing and additional levers to create a strong, tech-enabled and vibrant economy. You are an intrinsic part of this ambition and journey, and it's government's duty to support and enable you to add to our wonderfully diverse economy, but also enrich our culture and community. Throughout the course of today, I hope you, we can explore key areas of interest for the island's tech sectors, network, and together feed into a future strategy direction on the island's digital economy. The digital agency is putting greater emphasis on supporting the organic growth of those businesses domiciled here, working in partnership with industry to understand potential barriers to growth and help to overcome these. I really hope that everyone will leave here this afternoon feeling that they have a greater understanding of the support available to grow um, existing capacity, seize new opportunities and work together with government to make our island even stronger and more resilient. Thank you and I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much, Minister Allenson. Now I'd like to welcome on stage Lyle Raxall, CEO of Digital Isle of Man. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to the Minister and our Chair, uh, Phil Adcock, for their opening words. Over the past couple of years, we've had many suggestions to run an island uh, technology conference. So welcome to the inaugural Digital Isle event, and I thank you all for being here. Through the first part of today, the digital team will provide some insights into our different focus areas. They'll provide some context of their area, the beneficial uh, 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 outcomes to the island, and what we aim to achieve. We also have a number of other panels through the day, which will enable us to dive a little deeper into some of these areas. We'll be documenting these sessions, and we'll be considering what we hear today in some detail against our current and future strategies. But first, let me start with a retrospective. As a tech sector, we have made some significant progress over the past three years. I say we because the success is based on a collaboration of the digital agency, the island's businesses, and wider government. It's by working and communicating together that we can achieve greater results. So as such, we predict, predict we'll achieve 247 new jobs in 2021. This is a year when our borders have been closed for much of the time. A year where much of the globe has had restrictions on travel and uh, obstacles have been created by the pandemic and created an ever-changing set of challenges. You can see that we have 172 jobs fully landed this year and we have a large proportion of 75 additional roles due to land before the end of the year. While these are all very real roles that are in progress and should land before the end of the year, 
our experiences, especially this year, teach us that additional complications can arise at any time. But we are cautiously optimistic that the majority of these roles will be realised before the end of the year. Our spread of jobs is not surprising. The majority are in e-gaming. We have 128 realised and 70 planned. That's nearly 200 jobs on the island this year in e-gaming alone, against our ambitious target of 150 jobs. In fact, at the beginning of the year, we proposed a target of 100 jobs, anticipating the challenges of COVID. When we presented this to the e-gaming strategic advisory board at the beginning of the year, they challenged us. They suggested a new target of 150 new jobs. Given this was a target that we were all seeking to achieve together, we accepted the challenge, and I'm pleased to see that we've managed to achieve that. Interestingly, we also see an increase of 31 jobs in the blockchain sector. Blockchain was the first new sector explored by the digital agency once it was created. It's been an interesting and at times challenging journey. The approach has been adapted and iterated to a point where we now appear to have an established sector on the island. We've seen gains in esports, media, and other digital businesses, but nowhere near the levels of e-gaming. As we look into next year, we expect to see more jobs in esports, and we consider how we can work with our partners to encourage jobs in other areas such as media, data, and software to ensure diversification whilst ensuring continued growth of the e-gaming sector. Of course, not all opportunities materialise. This year, we've seen many businesses having to refocus, pause their plans, and make difficult decisions to right-size their operations. We've lost 84 planned jobs due to a host of different reasons. But the fact that we track our lost jobs, and we endeavour to understand why and learn from that, um, I believe is an important part of our continuous improvement. Each loss is as painful for the digital team as it is for the partners we work with. As we look forward to next year, we have over 400 jobs in our pipeline. When our confidence level is applied, we expect 187 jobs to land next year. While this sounds like a good proportion of our target next year, we do see our opportunities move out to the right whilst not necessarily reducing ever landing. We've yet to understand how we can provide better confidence in timescales as there are so many external factors. But overall, as an island, we've achieved a great deal this year, and I believe this is largely down to partnerships. The fact that we all play our part, we all realise the benefits, I believe this is our first step in working together more effectively in an open and honest manner to achieve greater success for all of us in the coming years. Of course, we're not without our challenges. I think we can all acknowledge that it's still difficult to fill positions we need on the island. Across the agencies, this was identified as the single biggest issue. It's an issue that's extremely difficult to solve, but it's one where we can make incremental improvements, such as working with our new technology trading provider on Island Readiness, who are here today, who've developed our digital literacy training, which we launched in September. Let's recognise that skills is not just an issue for the Isle of Man, especially when it comes to digital skills. It's good to see the skills issue is also acknowledged on the island plan, and I hope this will give us more focus to this particular topic across the entirety of government. We will be touching at skills at various points of the day, and it's a key focus of the digital agency moving forward. Immigration has been a hugely challenging issue through the year. Brexit was already presenting new challenges before we'd even heard of COVID. The pandemic created an ever-shifting, complex scenario that, at times, felt like fighting a battle on all fronts. If we found it difficult, imagine how our colleagues in the immigration team felt dealing with this day in, day out. I'm sure we can all appreciate the pressure that can create in any team. Then imagine all of your customers are also fighting their own variations of that battle too. It's not a recipe for success. We surveyed the industry earlier in the year and we provided immigration, uh, the feedback to the immigration team, along with some suggestions for improvements. The immigration team have been completely open 
to the feedback and absolutely focused on finding solutions to overcome some of these challenges. And they'll be presenting later to us, uh, to us later today. Banking has also been an ever-present issue for the uh, agency. It's a challenge which we have less influence over as a government and one that's become more apparent as we've seen more crypto businesses move to the island. We'll also be discussing this in a bit more detail later today. But we also have much to build on. Blockchain has become a self-sustaining sector on the island and businesses are recognising the Isle of Man as a jurisdiction for blockchain. As an island, we've come together to learn uh, and about and to support this sector. The FSA have worked closely with us uh, uh, on this sector to achieve success. We now have an opportunity to build on this and look at other digitally-led financial services businesses, harnessing what we've learned from crypto. We have a huge opportunity in esports to become the first jurisdiction to legitimise it, either through regulation or something similar. Beyond this, we can uh, become a back office for gl the global esports industry and perhaps even make inroads into the wider video games industry. Through the Internet of Things, we have an opportunity to bring exciting, innovative trials to the island. So many people vent their frustration to me that we once had a 3G trial on the Isle of Man. We can do bigger and better trials in the future. We have the infrastructure, the talent and the environment to support it. And finally, what I consider to be one of our biggest overlooked opportunities is we have the ability to be different. We don't need to be wildly different, just subtly different. We, and that can be enough to drive business to the island. We may be the Pepsi to the UK's Coca-Cola. Maybe not everybody's preference, but enough people's preference to make a great opportunity. We have the ability to create our own laws and regulation in a way that can attract targeted businesses and industries. And this is an opportunity we must continue to exploit. So as we look forward to 2022 and beyond, um, we look to partner with industry and wider government to grow and diversify the economy on the Isle of Man. Our primary measure of success in the agency is economic growth. And to support this, we will create at least 250 new jobs in the digital sector in 2022. We will also work across government to remove friction around the growth of the workforce. This includes working to improve the availability of skilled workers for businesses, working to streamline the movement of new workers to the island, and focusing on removing any barriers to growth for our island's businesses. By 2023, I'd like to see another new sector established on the island. This may be esports, or it could be a sector driven by the innovation surrounding IoT or tech trials. And finally, to support a thriving digital economy, we need to have a strong infrastructure in place. A key deliverable of this is, of course, the National Broadband Plan, which is due to be delivered in the second half of 2022, 2024. Sorry. I look forward to hearing discussions as we go through today and beyond, and I'm sure we'll hear other priorities, objectives, and hopefully some new ideas. The Digital Agency is here to listen, to work with you, and to deliver the right environment for the digital economy to thrive. Thank you. And now I'd like to hand over to Tony Yor, who will explain how he will drive continued growth for the e-gaming sector on the Isle of Man. Thank you. So, I'm Tony Yor. I'm the head of e-gaming for the Digital Agency. Uh, it's really encouraging to see so many, so many of our colleagues out here in this conference. So this is a big, big map of the world, and we wanted to look at where we are positioned and where we think everything's going for the next 18 months. 18 months ago, when the pandemic hit and global conferences were cancelled or worldwide, we, we anticipated a real drop in our opportunity pipeline and uh, a number of companies who would want online gaming licences. Fortunately, it was quite the opposite. So whether it's due to the increased digital content marketing we put out, or whether it's that everybody had Isle of Man like gaming license on their to-do list, it's been one of the best years we've ever had, or the best 18 months we've had. Uh, 
Why? From the rhetoric we hear, the, the reason people are coming to the Isle of Man is because of the high international standards of AML and CFT and KYC that is driving a lot of business here. We have 62 licenses live at the moment, with a busy queue of applications still to be reviewed. And this is 68% up on where we were in 2017, at the end of 2017. The GSC have hired more staff to cope with the massive demand of licenses, even stealing one of my team. And we're processing double the applications that we're doing each year. We've seen major operators choosing to license and set up operations in the Isle of Man. The pandemic also saw many operators increasing their operations and workforce on the island to give them business continuity as their international offices around the world shut down with very little ability to work from home. This afforded them the ability to continue operating and will suit them well in the future if, we ever have to, if they ever have to shut down again in other jurisdictions. So we looked at, for 2022, what are our plans and targets as we start to see the conference circuits return, having just returned from Malta last week, where there was 10,000 people at a conference, and it, was, it seems to be a huge demand for in-person meetings, evidenced by the conference today. When we analyse the global market since the pandemic, we can see a few patterns emerging on market share, growth, intense growth in certain regions, and major opportunities in different regions. So if we start with the US, with 30, over 30 states already regulating sports betting following the repeal of PASPA in 2018, the USA has shown the highest revenue growth. Now while this may not be a direct opportunity for the Isle of Man itself, it's, it's an opportunity for a lot of our operators and suppliers and providers that are operating within the US. And it's, it is taking a lot of focus for a lot of businesses. This has also driven a, a large amount of, you've probably seen in the news, M&A through that sector, where the inevitable combination of US retail and rest of the world online operators have, have done deals to actually go forward and, and launch in different states. Um, and a natural transition is that the US retail is acquiring a lot of the online operations, or vice versa. The other one, Canada's recent sports betting legislation has also driven a lot of focus uh, and become a quite a big opportunity. I think these markets will, of course, take a lot of resource, a lot of money. Um, it's a slow process and maybe only six or ten of the big operators will succeed. Um, and some of the smaller ones that do start succeeding will just get acquired. If we move on to Europe, I think now that Germany and Holland have eventually regulated after many years, we're seeing Many operators and businesses looking outside of Europe, now that 24 out of 27 EU countries have a local licensing regime, as to where to go next. <clears throat> and Finland is even considering the roots of local licensing regulation being one of the last bastions of Europe. The impending regulations in our Irish neighbour will also be interest to many operators, especially as an Irish EU base may be even preferable to uh, other countries within, within the EU. Now that, now that European tier one operators are looking outside of Europe at the rest of the world markets, they're also looking at an experienced international regulator that can help them on that journey. And we're seeing a lot of inquiries coming through on that, on that basis. Now, if we, look at, if we look at the opportunities, Southeast Asia, Asia is always going to hold a dominant position in the gambling market and the gambling economy despite the frequent changes in markets in that region, and especially the back of the pandemic hits on different economies there. It'll be, continue to be a key market for the Isle of Man gaming community, as we already have a network of highly experienced gaming providers and operators within that sector. There'll be, continue to be a focus on the Philippines, especially with the upcoming presidential elections, and the recent hard felt impacts on their economy of turnover taxes and income taxes for players, and the concerns over what new presidential coming in, what their view on gaming will be. Consequently, we've seen a rise in interest for companies out of the Philippines and from out of Asia to have a Western base, 
in the Isle of Man, and this has given them business continuity as they've seen the challenges of trying to operate out of Asia. Japan is going to be one of the final ones where we're anticipating the launch of their first land-based integrated casinos, but it's a strong market for our gaming economies. Looking at one of the fastest growing ones, LATAM, over 20 countries, 650 million population. LATAM on the back of the pandemic and the negative impact on their resale casino and betting operations has seen increased growth and in regulation in online gaming and is expected to grow to in excess of $3 billion by 2025. New and existing operators are looking at pan-Latin American operations especially those European operators coming out of Spain and Portugal that already have a customised bespoke language offerings and experience. Although there's much in common over the Latin American countries, it's still not a single market. Regulation in Brazil is a closely anticipated event, but it has been for years and it'll probably take another two, three years before it gets over the line. And while many other South American countries are already looking at regulation, it's the process that they go through to get there but it's going to be a high growth region in the coming years and it's going to be an interesting target for us. Moving on to Africa, it's another continent where retail betting and casinos were hugely hit by the pandemic, still are. Yet Africa is predicted to be the fastest growing continent over the next two years. As smartphone and internet penetration increases you know, at speed where in most countries two thirds of the population are under the age of 27. These are countries with huge sports followings, whether it's football, rugby, cricket, there's great opportunities in those markets. And we're seeing a lot of operators already working with Pan-African Reach, who are looking for dot-com international licenses to help them uh, diversify their businesses. And we've seen substantial operations in East and West Africa, such as Kenya and Nigeria, and many more of those countries are, are, will follow. The final one we want to look at is India. And so India has seen renewed focus for many operators, especially Southeast Asian, looking for a new target market, a new home, somewhere close to home. The recent state court decisions in many of the states have seen gaming, online gambling being legalized, unlegalized, disputed, courts winning, operators winning, and the, defi and the definition of what is true online gambling and what is skill gaming. It's still a country where Rummy, poker and fantasy sports are the big legal games of skill and not to mention where you can have betting on cricket and horse racing. 1.4 billion population which is technologically savvy, very mobile, young players and it drives a very popular market there. So whilst maintaining and growing our Asian gaming businesses, we'll, we'll identify operators in, the, in these new sectors, LATAM, Africa, India, and try and help them grow the businesses with an Isle of Man gaming license. These are huge markets to tackle, multiple countries, so we will focus on hubs and cities in each continent where we have clusters of high quality businesses that we can engage with and look to support them in their international growth with an Isle of Man gaming license. Challenges. Local, local B2C licenses or license requirements in other countries will gradually reduce the value of the Isle of Man B2C license. This won't happen tomorrow, and there's still plenty of business and plenty of time, but we need to plan for this impact with other products and new products. It can still, moving staff, as we're all aware, it can still be a very challenging process to move staff to the Isle of Man from other countries with regards to immigration, housing, and we must continue to ease this path for our businesses. As, as Lyle touched on before, we've, we've working with immigration very closely, working on how we can move this process out and make it easier for them. Our infrastructure needs to resolve issues with flights and housing to support the income and growth in jobs. We said earlier we expect an influx of two to three hundred people wanting to move here. We need to be able to house them, we need to be able to get them here, we need to get there, help them even with getting banking going, which we have a panel on later. We are, as, as an island, 
we're not always totally financially attractive to operators when compared with some of our competitors. Whether it's tax, VAT, gaming duty, we all, all the jurisdictions handle that in different ways. So we must look at how we can review these areas and where we can affect significant changes. We already have a working group with the GSC, Customs, Income Tax, Treasury, and the Digital Agents and DFE to look at the impacts of these areas and what is within our control to change and what could be a benefit for businesses and the island. If we look at the opportunities, we need to have increased focus on some of our existing products. Our software license that we introduced in 2019 has been hugely successful. Since its introduction, it now accounts for a third of all of our licenses. And this will become more, more and more important to us as our B2C license becomes eroded. Whilst at the same time we need to have leverage our existing products, we need to evaluate some new products on the same basis as when we introduced the software license. We should, we'd, everybody had been asking for, us, for a software license for years before we actually put it in. So we're looking at products that could be innovative, but have high reward and low risk, whilst we don't want to endanger our hard-earned hard -earned reputation within the industry. Uh, We've, we've always had a pragmatic and forward-thinking regulator who looks at their business needs for the future. Regulator, regulation normally trails far behind technology and business innovation, but I think our regulator is much closer to these products than a lot of our competitors. And we will be sitting down through, this, through the next 18 months reviewing different types of products, work on whether they suit what our, our economic climate is, whether they suit our regulatory regime, and whether they're whether it works with the GSC. As an island that is 40% rural, we have plenty of room for businesses to grow with an infrastructure built to support companies who may need to implement work from home practices again, hopefully not. But now we have operators not only using the Isle of Man for disaster recovery, but creating mini operational hubs capable of keeping their businesses online no matter what the challenges are elsewhere in the world. Our size and population density with low population density with no local housing restrictions makes this island an attractive place to place to base a business. A safe and secure operational hub with one of the lowest crime rates in, in Europe. And these are factors that a lot of businesses now are looking at where can we base the business and these are key issues for them, not just purely financial, but how do we want to where, where do we want to locate our business, where do our staff want to be, where do we want them to work. We've seen glo global growth, as we said earlier, across the e-gaming sector in all markets. Some of these markets will be attractive to the Isle of Man. We'll review these. We'll go in out and look at these hubs. And then we'll look at how, how we communicate with these companies. The biggest opportunity we have to grow business on the island is our strong reputation. We was, uh, for a long time, People questioned about coming here and meeting the barriers to entry and meeting the high standards that we set. Now, in the last 18 months, people are coming here because of the barriers we set and the high standards we want to maintain. This will not be changing as we want to continue to be a bastion of highly regulated international gaming. And rest assured, we do not want to drop our standards. We're seeing an influx of businesses from other jurisdictions, whether that's Curacao, Malta, wherever. We, don't, we have 62 licenses. Our intention is not to go to 500 licenses overnight. We, we will take high class, best in class companies that want to base here with somewhere with high recognizable standards. So to sum up, there, there are a lot of global challenges. The conference market is opening up, but we still see plenty of opportunity. And this, and this is uh, hopefully going to be a, a continued growth market for e-gaming in 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Good looking at you.
Thanks, Tony. Um, I think you know, we can all see there's still plenty of opportunity in uh, our uh, e-gaming sector as we continue to drive growth here. Um, we are looking to achieve 180 new jobs in the sector uh, next year. Uh, we currently just achieved uh, 60 live GSE licenses, which is our target for 2021. We're looking to grow that to 70 by the end of 2022. And importantly, we do need to start diversifying our opportunities. We have a very strong pipeline at the moment, but we need to look, start looking to the future to new markets. So we have to uh, ta agree three targeted markets um, by the second half of 2022. So again, thank you, Tony, for that. Um, I'm now going to uh, introduce Steve Billinghurst, who's our regulatory lead uh, for blockchain. And he's going to talk to you about how he's going to drive continued growth for the blockchain sector in the Isle of Man and widen out to fintech businesses. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Makes you realise that photograph there was taken three years ago. I didn't realise I'd aged that much, but obviously blockchain has really had an effect on me. Um, I put you all at ease. If I lose my way, I'm not going to ask you about Peppa Pig World. So don't worry. You won't have to answer any questions about Peppa Pig World. Uh, so, um, quick intro then for anyone who doesn't know who I am. Um, I've been now with the digital agency working on the blockchain initiative since its creation, nearly three years ago. Uh, I do remember at another event taking on blockchain game and seeing if anyone wanted to actually be a physical blockchain, which was a really interesting exercise. Um, but in that time, I've seen, we've seen a whole raft of different businesses come to us with different ideas of how they're going to, to implement this new technology, which actually probably isn't that new. It's been around now for 13 years, so it's not quite as new as we thought it was. But it must actually be right now on the cusp, and I'm sure that we've read this year after year after year, but it is on the cusp of actually becoming a significant platform of technology for businesses. Deloitte's in 2001, 21, 2021 did a global survey of blockchain, and practically 100% of businesses that responded to the question of, would you see blockchain as part of your financial service um, platform, they said yes, they would. Within the near future, they see blockchain as being a significant part of how they deliver financial services. And I don't know if any of you have spotted the slight subtlety here. This slide says blockchain. Your running order says blockchain slash fintech. So what I want to do is I'd want to just kind of say that, that whilst this is an underlying technology in terms of blockchain, we've always been reasonably, on the Isle of Man, we've been very agnostic about encouraging lots of different businesses to come to us from the whole spectrum where they use this technology. But we have seen a significant, inter uh, significant activity in the intersection of where you've got blockchain, uh, distributed ledger technology, and the delivery of financial services. And, those, and that really is why there's now been this more of a pivot into fintech as a, uh, as a subject of matter for the digital agency working hand in hand with our colleagues in finance and with the Financial Services Authority to see how we can mature and promote the delivery of you know, the Isle of Man as a place to actually use this technology to deliver financial services and, fi and financial instruments, which are becoming more and more digital. So perhaps why don't we just explore what fintech is, and I suspect if I asked for a definition from the audience, I'd probably have about 200 definitions, but I'm going to give you mine and the one that actually we've been using within the digital agency. So fintech as a word comes from the combination of, it's a, it's a portmanteau of financial services and technology, and you bash the two together and you get fintech. And that's exactly what it is. It is the delivery of financial services through a technology-led and technology-enabled um, business model. And what usually happens is you see more of that coming from those that traditionally sit outside of financial services as their business. 
There are other definitions, but it's not the one that we've looked at, and I don't believe this is necessarily it. It's not necessarily fintech. It's not about the internal digital transformation of current financial services businesses. I was just looking recently, and I noticed that both Goldman Sachs and uh, Citigroup actually both define themselves as technology companies that have got financial services licenses. Uh, and I was, uh, a while ago now, I was in Guernsey and I sat listening to an insurance company that was licensed out of Guernsey and they said, today we're an insurance company built on a technology platform, tomorrow we'll be a technology company that writes insurance. And absolutely, I see that that is the way that financial services are going to be moving and how they're being delivered. And so because of that, blockchain and distributed ledger technology, I believe, has a real significant part to play and the Isle of Man has a part to play in therefore moving into this sector. So why don't we just explore this diagrammatically and hopefully you'll be able to all see this. Apologies if it's a little bit busy. It comes, you, know, consult, you, know, you can take the boy out of consulting, you can't take the consultancy out of the boy. So consultants always have busy slides. What, we're trying, what this diagram tries to show, if I... I'm going to take the top half first. So I'm going to take the. I'm going to take. I'm not going to be able to wander. I'm going to take this half first. What that shows is that shows the delivery of financial services, and how it pivots between um, whether or not you lead with a financial service business model or whether or not you lead with a technology business model. And the bottom half is about technology providers, and how they either deliver into the financial services because that's where they. Start or they start actually from a technology platform and a technology provider uh, basis. So let's look at the diagram from left to right. And we look at it through the financial services lens. Here on the top row, you've got traditional financial services businesses. They, are highly, they, they highly understand regulation. They already are pretty efficient and they're running global banks significant corporate and life insurance companies, global asset managers, they're there on the left-hand side. What we've been seeing in the last three, five years is this disintermediation and this disruption of financial services by end companies that are actually technology-based. And they're going, my technology can drive financial service delivery, provide better customer experience, provide better user interface, uh, I don't know much about regulation, but I'm going to deliver those financial services from my technology side rather than from my understanding of financial services. And so here you've got the digital bank uh, providers, the challenges, alternative lenders, peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, you've got alternative payment providers, many of whom we've kind of seen recently in the Isle of Man, both in terms of supporting e-gaming and with the creation of Capital International Bank as the first digital bank on the Isle of Man. If we take the bottom half and we look at the bottom half from a left to right, here what we've got is we've got our core financial service technology platform providers. They're already in the marketplace. They're already providing data management, software, market infrastructure, and they're providing that into the financial services players. They're highly efficient. They're able to, to support efficient use of uh, and delivery of financial services with minimum kind of back office and middle office costs. But what we've seen recently over the, over the last decade is this huge growth in technology companies that have themselves have very large platforms and networks and crowds of customers. So, you know, you, you know, we all know about Facebook turning around and saying what it wanted to do is it wants to provide financial services. It wants to allow people to, to transfer money peer-to-peer -peer between each other. They've got a huge platform that they think they can run it off of, but they have an absolutely massive network. They have a bigger network than any global bank. You've got, so you've got consumer-facing technology companies, Alibaba, for instance, running their market in, the, in China. They believe that they can run financial services off the back of a marketplace that they, they deliver to chi their Chinese customers. And then, you know, so with online retailers and social media companies, they're actually coming slap bang into the same space in terms of financial services, saying, well, we can deliver this much better because of our connections to our customers. So how does this fit in with Digital, with digital Isle of Man and the agency? 
Well, Digital Isle of Man sits on the right-hand side. We see businesses coming into this, this model from the right-hand side. Our colleagues in the Finance Isle of Man, they see customers coming into this model from the left-hand side. So we have a completely different view of this same marketplace depending on what our lens is. I can't believe we haven't really seen many people on the bottom. I haven't had a, convers I haven't had a conversation with Mark Zuckerberg asking if he can put up Meta on the Isle of Man, unfortunately. But we have actually had conversations with some significant Southeast Asian businesses. We had one conversation with somebody that had a huge consumer-facing uh, platform and network that wanted to run a digital bank. And they were looking to use the Isle of Man as a basis to run a digital bank for the unbanked. What we normally see is we normally see people come in on the top half. We've seen significant players using blockchain and distributed ledger technology as a way of disrupting provision of financial services. They are keen to use the Isle of Man as a test bed to grow their, their understanding of blockchain, to use the regulatory framework that we currently have as a way of making the launch pad into the, into the market. And that has positives and benefits for us as, a, as an agency and for an island. The challenges that we faced when we, and we have faced for the past three years and we continue to face is around keeping pace with regulatory change. And not just us, but our, cl our clients and our customers too in the, in, in the digital agency around this initiative. In fact, regulators themselves have a huge task to maintain pace against the change of demands for regulation to change. And that is, that is constantly a challenge for us. Uh, we work strongly with the FSA. We have done over the last three years. Um, I have to say the COVID pandemic didn't help us in terms of keeping the momentum going. Uh, but we have, you know, we have, um, we have recognized the challenge and we continue to work to address it. Uh, Bearing in mind, small, nimble, small jurisdictions usually can be more nimble in this space. I know that there are jurisdictions, Switzerland and Gibraltar, as small financial service jurisdictions have made a case for certain regulatory changes. Uh, the Swiss Digital Finance Act, the Gibraltar Distributed Ledger Technology and its Consolidation of its Financial Services Act within nine months. You know, 90 pieces of legislation down to one, I think, is a significant achievement. It's difficult, but it is doable. Um, but at the same time, you've still got the SEC, you've got the, the FCA in the UK. They struggle to keep pace. And I'll come on to why the, F, you know, the FCA's struggle to keep pace and why that's actually been a significant opportunity for us. We always want to ensure that we attract quality business to the Isle of Man, and it is one of our, you know, it remains a major challenge. From the get-go, we've been working in partnership with the FSA to ensure that we actually carry on that initiative, uh, working hand in hand with uh, uh, with colleagues, looking at business plans, looking at white papers that these technology companies put forward. Uh, helping them find a way through the maze of regulation. But at the same time, we have also, you know, we've sieved out those businesses that we really never thought were good, that were going to get, you know, go anywhere. And, you know, we haven't allowed them in that way to, be, to find a home in the Isle of Man. But it remains a challenge for us to make sure that we can kind of spot those. We're not necessarily, you know, only wanting to spot the real winners, but we do want to maintain that quality as, they, as these businesses come here. Uh, you may hear this, this comment more and more through the day, uh, and apologies for it, but local banking right, you know, is an issue, and it remains a significant issue. Uh, that word blockchain, the description crypto, I think it sends most bankers into a complete cold sweat, and compliance officers also start shaking, and their heads spin, and smoke comes out their ears. Uh, it is a challenge. Um, understanding is an, is an issue. Uh, and so we continue our communication strategy with those to try and find a way forward. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's not been easy. Uh, I even put a proposition to, uh, to the major banks on the island only last week, unfortunately, to get a full Yahtzee of no's. But um, uh, you know, that doesn't stop us. We'll continue to try and work, as, work our way and work with our, the businesses to see if we can find those, uh, those, those banking solutions for them. 
And as well as the operational capital that they require in terms of the day-to-day -day banking arrangements, they still require access to capital and to markets. That top line that I showed in the previous diagram, the entities that we were seeing coming in from the right-hand side were very young. They were very new. They had great ideas. They thought they had great ideas. They weren't all great. Uh, but they, were, they often struggled to get access to capital and access to, to, to markets. And whilst they consider the Isle of Man to be offshore financial centre, they consider us to have you know, pools and pools of capital to deliver to help them grow. That's not always the case, especially when you're talking about really young businesses that have got seed fund, you know, want seed funding or first round funding. And I'm sure I think there's a topic later on, there's a session uh, later on that talks about, in the breakout sessions, that talks about startups and capital raising and everything else. But it becomes an issue. We should find ways here to be able to leverage off of our connections, our connections with TICE if we can, how we can actually encourage these young businesses and modern businesses to raise finance in a modern way. Um, from the word go, we, I've been talking to businesses about issuing you know, digital securities and off the back of that we worked very hard with the FSA to come up with some guidance for, um, for those businesses to understand how they how the regulatory framework fitted their, their needs. But they do want to raise money in, in innovative ways, in ways that probably not all of us necessarily at the, at the outset would understand. So it remains a challenge. We need to work hard at it. Uh, and we continue to work with the FSA and with businesses to try and, um, to try and find answers for, for our customers and our clients. But I still think that fintech provides huge opportunity for the island if we, when we get it right. Um, when we talk about the digitalization of financial services, it's a process that's already started. It's here to stay. And I, do, you know, and I foresee a huge shift in the digital asset market as we move forward. And with that, we will see more peer-to-peer, -peer, yes. We will see more disintermediation. We will see more... Um, institutions fall away and actually are, you know, we'll begin to work on a on a person-to-person -person basis. Um, uh, the concept of uh, that is out there right now that's quite buzzy is decentralized finance. It's about the delivery of financial services without the use of some significant players in the marketplace. So our, our ability to expand into this fintech market I think is absolutely critical. I know we may have some finance, uh, um, some of our finance agency um, peers and colleagues in the room here, but actually I do predict that we will see a fall off of traditional financial service markets and financial services products. And if we don't backfill that with fintech initiatives and digital asset and digital finance initiatives, I think we'll find ourselves sitting in a slightly different economic um, landscape in the future of our own national economy in terms of where our our GDP is coming from if we don't work to support our, our financial services sector with fintech initiatives. Remember I spoke about the FCA and their ability, inability to, to keep up to speed with regulation in the UK. So a little story is the fact that uh, back in January this year, the FCA and the UK were supposed to have completed the codification of the fifth AML directive into their legislation, especially around crypto businesses. And they couldn't do it. They'd had nine months to do it and they still couldn't get there. They had only five licenses issued and they had a backlog of a significant number of applications. Whilst we were in the middle of our second and our third COVID lockdown, and so movement to the Isle of Man was really difficult, we came up with a concept in the digital agency of uh, registration under the Designated Business Act on a subject to basis rather than on an absolute basis. And working hand in hand with the FCA, FSA locally, we came up with exactly that, the ability for an off-island business to go through the whole designated business process on the basis that it could move to the island if it wanted to. And the FSA said they would happily look at those applications and if they were satisfied and the quality was right, then they would connect that with the, with the um, they would connect to the company and say, subject to you moving here, and you moving here and setting up in exactly the way you said you wanted to, you were going to, 
then subject to that, we offer you a, a clear flight path of being registered as a designated business in the Isle of Man. And that was extreme, that's been extremely useful. The number of conversations we've had that have opened up off the back of that has been really good. And I thank the FSA for, for, for working with us and taking that step forward. So that established reputation that we have is there, and which is just something that we need to work on, and it's an opportunity that we can do. And in my dying minutes, I don't know if anyone saw the news yesterday about Collins Dictionary making NFT the word for the year. And it's the first time a three-letter abbreviation has ever been made a word, uh, been, been brought into a word for the year in a Collins or Oxford English Dictionary. I won't ask anyone to define an NFT, but watch this space. The crossover between digital art, NFTs, private wealth management, as we have new inheritance of wealth being passed down generation to generation, I think is, is ripe for the Isle of Man to take forward both on the digital side and on the financial services side. Uh, and if we get our acts together and we work on this pretty quickly, I think that we have, a, we have a, an ability here to carve out an opportunity where I know that other crown dependencies and other offshore private wealth um, markets have not managed to achieve yet. I'm not even sure some of them really understand what an NFT is. That's a quick whiz through. Apologies if it's been too fast. Apologies if I've used terminology that some of you are still going. I'm not too sure what you meant by that, Steve. Uh, grab me any other time during the day. I'm here all day. Uh, and I'd love to see you at, at 3.55 when we're going to talk about distributed ledger technology in the breakout room uh, with some other colleagues and with Lee Hills as the, um, as the moderator. Uh, but thank you for that. I'll pass you back to Lyle. Thank you very much, Steve. So um, what are we going to deliver in 2022 to drive this continued growth of blockchain um, and widen it into fintech businesses? Well, firstly, we need to deliver jobs. So we're going to deliver 40 new jobs uh, in the blockchain uh, stroke fintech space next year. But very importantly, we are working very closely with our colleagues in the finance agency and in the FSA to create an innovation hub proposal um, to the FSA board by the second half of 2022. This is going to be a key change in the way that we work and the way that we deal with uh, businesses who want to go through registration. It's very much around making sure they have very clear expectations of what that journey is going to look like, uh, very clear expectations of what they're required to deliver as they go through that process. Um, and make it easier for them to have certainty that if they do the right things and they hit the right um, benchmarks, that they will be able to conduct their business on the Isle of Man. It's also very important for us across all three of those agencies to really understand what is coming to the island and how we're going to deal with it. So that's an incredibly important deliverable through next year. And then, of course, we've probably been a little bit quieter through 2021 with some of the challenges that we face globally, but we do need to ensure that we have a strong content strategy to attract not just the blockchain business, which we already see coming to our shores, but those wider fintech businesses um, as we look through 2022. Okay, with that, I am now going to invite uh, David Fenlon onto the stage. David is our uh, esports consultant and helped us create our esports strategy um, initially. And he's going to be uh, talking to us about how to create an esports sector in the Isle of Man. Hello, um, my name is David Fenlon. Um, I'm supporting uh, Digital Isle of Man around its esports strategy. Uh, today we're here to talk about the opportunities for the island and its businesses in esports and also why we're focusing on it now. Um, for me to understand this um, and for I think the room, um, I think it's quite important to really get a, a grip of where the industry is at this moment in time. Um, and to do that, I'm going to give a bit of a story of the industry and why it's relevant. Um, but to kick off with first, um, just a quick raise of hands. How many people here 
no, not a huge amount or are not overly comfortable with, uh, with their knowledge around the esports industry or only just about getting themselves into it. And how many people here would consider themselves very comfortable experts in the industry? One or two. And Chris Kissack wa waving wildly in the background. Um, that's good, that's good. You do not need to be an expert in this industry, nor do you realistically need to um, actually have vast amounts of knowledge in it to be both provide value to the industry but also be successful in it. But I think that the key thing from our perspective is that we need to go back to basics a little bit around what is eSports, why is important, and why should I care ultimately as a, a business on the island. So um, just to start off with, eSports itself, and it's become a bit of a catch-all term for anything sort of video gaming which is new, um, is simply competitive uh, video games between two people that other people are willing to watch. Um, and this is quite a quaint idea, the idea that you know, people are actually willing to watch others play video gaming, but actually it's a big thing. And um, there's a large number of people who are willing to do this. If you look at the little uh, graph of the hundreds of millions that are, is in the uh, top middle of it, this, there are, billion, there are billions of people who watch this worldwide and the hundreds of millions of people who consider themselves fans. You can fill a 90,000 seater stadium um, to watch video games being played at a professional level. And, you, and this is a global market. Equally, what we're seeing is that the number of people who are becoming fans is actually increasing after the pandemic as well. So this uh, phenomenon is here to stay. There's a lot of money involved with it as well. To give an example, uh, one of the li largest prize pools out there for a tournament is for $42 million if you win it. Um, what's crazy is the fact that only two million of that was put up by the tournament organizers. 40 million was donated by the community at large just because they wanted to pump up the prize pool. It's really quite crazy, but it's big business. And that is something which gives you an idea around it. But the question of why it's important comes to, uh, comes to mind next. You know, yes, the eagle-eyed amongst you will see that it's uh, uh, involved with uh, the video gaming industry and is a nice entry point to that which is typically quite closed. But actually it represents a much deeper cultural shift and economic shift in consumer behaviour. So to give an example of this, um, uh, this cultural shift, we'll do a little bit of a thought experiment here. And I look around the room and I can see that no one here is over the age of 40, so you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit here. But uh, imagine that you are uh, in your mid-40s, uh, mid mid-50s, you are at a networking event by the bar, watering hole, or dinner party, and after the pleasantries that you exchange with people, people ask what you do as a hobby. And if you were to say to somebody, I play video games every night and talk to random people on the internet, um, it would be akin to social suicide, and like, you know, would be something slightly deviant. Um, you know, the, this is, this is not the case with millennials and Generation Z groups and those types of demographics. There's no stigma attached to it. In fact, there's a lot of interest. And this cultural shift's really important because it impacts the economic shift that's going on in the world at the moment. And the reason why there is no stigma attached to it is because in the early noughties, uh, video, became, video games became affordable. And parents took the attitude it was easier, more convenient, and significantly cheaper to let the kids play video games than bring them off to football or entertain them in general. And any parent in here will, will attest to the fact that sometimes it's just easier to give the child an iPad rather than trying to keep them uh, amused. Um, and so and what we see is a large number of kids in the, um, from millennials onwards went round to each other's houses to watch each other play and play with each other. And the result is that the demographics are not quite as, um, they don't hit the stereotypes that we think. 52% of gamers worldwide are women. And they skew towards their late 20s, early 30s. So it's not a teenage boy necessarily in his room dealing with this. You know, and that pushes to a much important view on the economic shift that's going on in the world. And that is that millennials and Generation Z groups are very large, there's a lot of them. There are more millennials, than the, uh, significantly more millennials in America, for instance, than there are baby boomers. They're well-educated. 
They are high earners, um, uh, in, especially in comparison to previous generations. They have more disposable income, so they're twice as likely to buy designer clothes than uh, older generations. And they're typically extraordinarily difficult to get at. Um, they live in walled gardens, um, so Netflix of this world, Amazon Prime, and they live in echo chambers, so on TikTok and on Instagram, they're typically getting content which they agree with, so breaking into that can be very, very difficult. For point of comparison, um, ITV's linear average uh, age um, of audience is 63. So the big advertising push of television, for instance, does not necessarily apply here. So eSports represents one of the few points of entry where you can actually get at this audience, this wealthy, educated and like, group that's willing to spend. And a large number of investors have noticed this. Now, the, as you can see from the wagon wheel um, at, in uh, middle bottom, the majority of uh, income for the industry at this moment in time is coming from advertising. That makes sense based upon like, uh, the fact that there's very few other ways of getting in touch with this particular audience. But also, it's only, it's, only a few, it's only a billion or two billions worth of revenue. In the last two years, eight billion has been invested into this, in this particular segment of the industry. And that's all, only the, what we know of, of the disclosed deals, is likely to be 15 to 20 billion. And the problem with that means there are certain expectations that come with that. And that means there's an explosive growth um, trajectory about to happen, most likely. And this is why we move on to why it matters for you. So scaling this business and this industry is going to be something which is going to be on all investors' minds. They, yes, it's a global market, but you can't service it from Manila. You can't service it from Berlin. You can't service it from LA alone. You need places, um, international bases. And you're going to have a large number of itinerant um, uh, businesses which are finding a home uh, or looking for a home at this moment in time. And this next three to five years is a once in an industry opportunity to grab that market share. So those of you who um, remember the e-gaming uh, craze um, 20 years ago, it has that same sort of feel to it. These businesses are these businesses need a lot of help around normal industry and business needs around scaling. And typically, they've come from a background where they've set it up in their own, uh, in their own bedroom. To put it in perspective, there's more experience and knowledge in this room about scaling an international business than there is in the entire esports industry globally. And that is very powerful. And the value of that, and articulating the value of that and quantifying it will be one of the defining factors of whether we're successful or not in being able to attract businesses to the island. Um, so with that brings us on to the challenges and, um, and opportunities. So I think the first point with this is that um, we're, not going to try and, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here around like, our approach to this industry um, uh, as opposed to others. That's not to say that it isn't a nuanced industry. I think that the key things to understand about this, we do have limited presence on Ireland. Uh, local businesses require a little bit of understanding around what the basic language is to speak to them. You do not need to be an expert in it. You certainly don't need to be enthusiastic about this particular industry, but you need to be able to relate the value that you are bringing to them uh, in a way that they can understand. There's also um, issues which were not um, present in the e-gaming uh, sector. These include the fact that there is no mandatory need for a license at this moment in time. That's not to say that there's no infrastructure needed and that uh, we can't provide great value as part of all of that, but it's a case of dealing with uh, organizations that own the IP, i.e. publishers or video game developers who are quite jealous of that IP. You're dealing with uh, groups that are used to doing it themselves and being able to convince them of that value is, being, is a really important place to, to uh, start from and we've taken a collaborative approach as a consequence of that. Now broadly speaking, we do have some great experience here on this island which is relatable if said in the right way. E-gaming is uncomfortably close to a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of these businesses but the reality is that uh, 
um, that using that experience without saying this is e-gaming is going to hold us in very good stead. We're also, um, we also have um, the uh, useful position of having very, very little competition. The only groups that have actually put themselves out there as wanting the home uh, esports groups are Malta and to a lesser extent Nevada, and both of them have had uh, mixed interactions with the industry. Other countries are either apathetic or in some cases quite hostile because it's a bit of a polit political pinata as video gaming in general. It's much easier to consider that there's a problem with video gaming and, uh, uh, and the use of um, uh, uh, games which have violence in it than to, for instance, say that your gun laws are particularly loose and that's the reason why somebody you know, ended up co committing an atrocity. So the reality is that where we are at this moment in time is that um, we have limited competition and this is where the timing is perfect of this. What we're looking to do with this is that we have um, a support structure to help local businesses understand how to speak to um, uh, potential, uh, potential targets and also to um, give them an idea of what the potential opportunities are out there. We are, uh, we are partnering with uh, the key uh, voice points in the industry with the Sports Insider. Um, Sam uh, Cook, who is the MD of that, is here today and is worth speaking to late if you can. Um, equally, there's um, our, we're working collaboratively with the largest players in the industry um, around um, protecting the integrity of some of the professional tournaments out there. Esports is a marketing tool, both the brands and also the publishers. If there is any question around the integrity of the uh, uh, tournaments themselves and the professional teams, and that it, there are problems with that at this moment in time, then the huge profits are lost as a consequence. So working with the industry with that is something that we're very excited about and we're in a very good position to take advantage of. Before I hand over to Lyle um, to talk about you know, the goals, I think there's a few points that I just want to um, kind of hone in on, is that rather than talking about be, making this place a video gaming island where we have these anonymous tournaments, etc., and so forth, whilst that's great, that's, um, that, that's fine, we're actually trying to help these businesses with global issues, not necessarily the issues that they are expert uh, in. We have a plan to do this, and the, and the industry is responding well to it. The key thing here is that whilst we may not necessarily get an Activision Blizzard to put their back office here, the companies that we're talking to and the companies that are growing are growing to 100 million to 500 million businesses. They need a home. These are the potential targets that would come in. And that's a very, very exciting place to be at this moment in time. Um, and if we're able to help them with their growing business and help them deal with all of the basic business back office functions, for instance, and other things that they will need, we'll be held in very high regard in the industry and we'll be able to capture that market share that we need. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. So, I hope you can all see there's a real, you know, great opportunity for us here in esports. We've started the journey. Um, we didn't expect a pandemic as we as we created it, but we have made some really good progress. Um, I think most people in the room will know Chris Kissick, who's got his own special stand at the back there. He's done a fantastic job of raising the awareness and raising the profile of the Isle of Man in this space uh, over the uh, past year or so. We now need to really focus on how we move this forward and, and start creating that economic value. Um, we have already committed to 20 new jobs in this sector for 2022 as we look at our economic profile. We need to continue marketing uh, the Isle of Man as an esports hub. Um, uh, Chris is still in place to support with some of that and we have a couple of new uh, starters joining the team. Uh, Josh Kingert's in the room with us today. He'll be starting with us in a, a couple of weeks' time. And uh, we have a chap called Liam Slack who is moving over from LA to join us in early January. Um, we need to, to deliver a program to upskill the island's businesses. Um, that isn't about upskilling the businesses in what they do well already. This is around upskilling them to communicate to a different market that perhaps reacts and has different expectations to some of those markets that we've been used to dealing with in the past. 
I see that this is a relatively easy cross-sell for most of the people in the room to shift uh, into a, uh, a market that's very adjacent to e-gaming but has some very evident pitfalls that we need to be aware of. And finally, and this is uh, a real focus for us, is we need to document the sector's regulatory needs um, by the second half of next year. We're only going to achieve legit legitimization of this industry if we do it by consensus and we do it with the industry. Um, uh, and that's, that's going to be a challenge. That means we need to have partners who believe in our vision that feel that that's going to drive them forward. Um, we have identified those partners um, and we are working with them. Uh, we now need to refine the detail on what the plan is and what we're going to work on together. Um, so I think that for, hopefully for all of us in this, this room, esports is becoming something that we're hearing more and more about and I hope there's a, a level of interest and excitement about what the next year is going to uh, bring to us. So now we're going to move on to the Internet of Things. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Sarah Ennett, our IoT manager, um, to come and talk to us about how we're going to grow the Isle of Man economy through the Internet of Things. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm Sarah Ennett and I've been in the digital team for just over a year now. I've worked in telecommunications for more years than I care to remember, but have ended up specializing in IoT for the last decade or so. And I think the reason why this technology type has appealed to me so much is because I'm both a big geek and also a bit of a hippie. And it combines my love of tech and gadgets with solutions that are often designed to make our world a better place. So why is IoT a focus for Digital Isle of Man? Well, it is a big umbrella term and just a classification, a technology type within our wider industry of services and solutions for technology. It's already a massive market and revenue opportunity and one that shows no sign of slowing down. Analysts will vary on the numbers, but all agree that they are big. So one source states that there are already 10 billion connected devices in the world, generating 441 billion US dollars in revenue. So a huge opportunity for all tech firms and service providers. But the technology can also benefit us more widely in society, introducing efficiencies, saving money, reducing our carbon footprint, and can help us lead healthier lives. So we should keep in mind, as I talk through this this morning, that there are these two different but very complementary types of benefits. Those that can make money from selling and supporting IoT solutions and those that can save money or introduce efficiencies or enhance their operations in some way as a result. So it is interesting because not only is it a key enabling technology for digital transformation in all business sectors and potentially all areas of life, but it is also an opportunity for local tech firms and expert consultants to capitalise on a rapidly growing revenue stream. So before I go much further, I really should touch on a definition. What even is IoT? And I'm sure most people in the room do know. But I've deliberately picked and simplified into these four categories. So the definition, Internet of Things, describing the network of physical objects, which are the things, that are embedded with sensors and software that collect information about their environment and connect to the internet to share it. That data is stored, processed, and presented in a way that makes sense. And insights are gained by combining different data sets into actionable information. So there are at least three components to an IoT solution. The hardware, the things themselves, the connectivity to the internet, and the data. And it is rare for one company to be able to, or want to, provide all of them. So it is already an ecosystem where organizations work together to create a true end-to-end -end solution. There are many different types of things, many different ways to connect, and of course, many different aspects to data storage and processing. The pluralization of things is deliberate. It implies that this is more than just one device collecting one type of data for one person or reason. So even in a consumer application of, for example, a fitness tracker, 
which on the face of it is just there for me to check how, how many steps I've taken each day? Well, actually, if your data, along with thousands of others, is anonymized and shared with an ethical medical research team, for example, that could lead to greater insights and understanding of correlation factors at play in the fight for medical improvement. So it's really the insights that are most important. How we can take action and make improvements as a result of the data we are capturing. And that is what we do need to focus on when we're talking to non-technical audiences. Demonstrate the benefits of the technology and make all that other stuff so much easier to understand, deploy and use. So what could an Isle of Man ecosystem look like, or what does it look like? So even though it's been around IoT for quite a long time, it is a very broad range of different technologies and different organisations. And for most, most options, it's still only very loosely coupled by standards and conventions. So the value chain is currently very fragmented and distributed. Most startups or established vendors concentrate on one, or maybe more, of those pillars, but rarely all of them. So there is natural opportunity to collaborate. If we want to support local innovation and indeed attract more people to trial on the Isle of Man, we can consider where we're at and each of these four pillars and what differentiators or USPs could be identified in each. So if we think about things, we have many retailers and service providers who sell solutions already. Home electronics, automation of lights and blinds, connected doorbells and many other. I don't know if you've seen, but IKEA sell many different types of home furnishings now with this sort of tech incorporated. There are speakers disguised as paintings. There are tables that have air quality monitors in and air filtration. And this is going to continue this type of convergence. We have an engineering and manufacturing sector here on the island, so new product ideas could be created and prototyped here. And from our perspective, we want to roll out as wide a variety of sensors as possible to collect non-personal data of interest to society, which can be openly disseminated, demonstrating real examples of how this tech can help to others. Connect. We have a relatively manageable coverage area on the Isle of Man with two great mobile networks and many other great providers offering different types of both wired and wireless connectivity. We have our own regulator, and we have the advantage there of being able to be agile with our radio frequency and our spectrum, and that can bring opportunity for people to come here and trial solutions that they might have to test in lots of different locations otherwise. So from our perspective, we've funded and rolled out a relatively low cost, dedicated Internet of Things network using LoRaWAN technology. And that, that L-O-R-A, that's a portmanteau, meaning long range. And that covers most of the island already. And it is available for anyone to use for free for proof of concepts, research and development, or educational, government, or third sector type applications. Data. We have a wealth of expertise already in this space, in this room, from data centers to cloud providers to software and application developers and beyond. And as a jurisdiction, we have sovereignty. So is there opportunity there for us to have regulatory agility, which might give an advantage? So we want to work with industry to build tools to demonstrate a safe and secure data repository and develop mechanisms to allow local innovators to make use of that data. And when we come to insights, we have lots of local consultancies and subject matter experts in many sectors. We have a brilliant university with lots of eager students and lecturers looking for research projects and topics. We already have government commitment to open data and a desire to accelerate evidence-based policy making. So we aim to build a visualisation that will demonstrate value and hopefully spark further innovation. So what's the wider benefit to the Isle of Man? I've got a picture here which is often used by people in the IoT space and a favourite concept of the smart city. Really, I should develop a smart village or smart town picture instead in our context. But actually, what we do want to work towards is demonstrating a whole smart island and what that could look like. It can be challenging when I'm trying to find return on investment, positive business cases to demonstrate the value to people for certain IoT applications because they are often framed in this smart city context. And we're talking about millions of residents. So we have the difficulty here of comparatively small budgets and economies of scale 
for a small jurisdiction versus obviously these larger countries. Well, let's pick an example on this, on this page here. Improve environment. So one of our first deployments was to roll out the indoor air quality monitors, as already mentioned. And we've put these into various settings, but the project that I was most excited was to do the trial in a primary school. And the key objective of this was to ensure a healthy learning environment. You might have seen more and more in the press recently about sitting in rooms with high CO2 concentration isn't great for us. Studies do show a very real decline in cognition, including how well people do on exams and tests, and how good you are at problem solving if you're in a certain level of concentration. So if we aren't monitoring this, then we won't know when to take action, whether that's as simple as opening a window, or if somebody has to take an exam or test, making sure they're in an environment that's going to help them do the best they can. The types of monitors we installed, though, do more than CO2 monitoring. They also look at light levels, temperature, humidity, occupation levels, levels of chemicals in the room. These and other factors really do allow building managers to ensure their environments are safe and optimal. And using this example, that we have seen real return on investment and ability to save money because they can understand the utilization of rooms and save money on energy, save money on cleaning rotors, etc. When we look at cost saving and operational efficiency, that's usually been a big driver for people that have adopted this top technology earlier than others. And sensors now are relatively low cost, and they do have the ability to be powered by battery for many years when configured correctly. So it does become a possibility that a sensor can reduce the number of times someone needs to attend a site to check something. A simple example of the levels in a salt grit bin, or perhaps an animal water trough if you're a farmer. And if you have responsibility for many locations, it can be costly to attend site, and of course not the best use of time if it ends up being an unnecessary trip. But let's really not forget the impact of reducing the number of car trips we make on our carbon footprint. Data-driven decisions is one of my favorites. Once again, a relatively small investment in, for example, people counters. We could install those in locations across the island, um, you know, in our retail areas, etc. And there are sophisticated solutions that can tell direction of travel, how many people are in a group, are you on a bike, etc. And then if we use those, as I said, in retail areas, we can look at the utilization you know, as a baseline figure, and then we can understand if we put some money into, for example, the events fund, is that really driving additional footfall? We can look at the numbers of people visiting plantations and what's the most busy time, understand if we have big enough car parks and all these other sorts of things. And it will aid decision making and allow the government to prove that the funds are delivering the expected benefits. Or at least, if you've got real-time monitoring, allow us to make changes if things aren't going as expected and we're indeed to hold a trial. Once data sets like these are shared though, it does allow other local innovators, of which we have many, to develop services and applications on top of those. So I would like a tool that showed me what's the busiest time at, for example, Arch Allegan Plantation. If my dog's feeling a bit reactive, I'd like to make sure it's the quieter time that I'm visiting. And there are lots of um, voluntary agencies, for example, Manx Wildlife Trust, who we know have limited volunteer numbers, and we want to make sure that they're being used at the busiest and best times. So if we look at the global challenges, I think I've tried to hint that it's seen, or it can be seen for non-technical audiences as a complex and fragmented ecosystem. We do have people that have concerns around data privacy, um, I mean, for example, putting those air quality monitors out, people did ask me, does it have a camera in it? Does it have a microphone in it? Is it listening to me? So we need to prove to people, A, that we are being responsible with their data, um, and if it is personally identifiable, that if it's ever shared, that it's anonymized. But, you know, some of these factors may be the perception that there's relatively low adoption on the Isle of Man. But we see opportunity there, and that's why we formed the IoT Accelerator our simple goal is to promote the use of this technology for the social and economic benefit of the island. As I say, we've rolled out an island-wide network. We've started to deploy um, trials and tests and talk about those. Every time I put something on LinkedIn about the trials that we've been doing, I've attracted comments and from people off-island who are interested in trialling their technology here. So that's something we want to concentrate on a lot more next year. 
But in the pipeline, we have got some outdoor air quality monitors that will look at particulate matter and you know, test the quality of our air. We have given some um, IoT kits to people like Code Club to see if this is something we can help with lesson planning with uh, younger people to inspire them into this career. And we, you know, there's lots more plans and lots more that we can do there. So I just want to let you know that we do have a breakout session at two o'clock in the chapel room where we want to really drill into more detail about the specifics of benefits of IoT to the Isle of Man and we would love you to join us there. And we're of course, please do grab me through the day because this is something I'm really passionate about and we'd love to get more people involved and share your ideas and help your, your trial ideas come to life. And with that, I would like to ask Lyle to come back to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. So, to grow the Isle of Man economy through IoT. This one's a bit more challenging for us. Um, as you notice, this is the one where we don't have a, a number of jobs. There are other economic benefits to driving uh, this uh, project. I don't think we fully understand all of the economic benefits at this point either, so there's still quite a lot of work to be done here. What we do know is we need to deliver more IoT projects across the island. Um, ideally, with people from coming from other jurisdictions to uh, trial those things here, um, we have a fantastic uh, natural sandbox where people can try things out. The more we measure, the more people will want to come here and uh, run their projects. So we have a target of eight new IoT projects for the end of 2022. We also want to make the IoT data publicly accessible by the end of the year as well, making sure that this data is available for people to look at and to base decisions on, especially if we want to try drive societal decisions, is really important. Not just the data being available, but also the fact that there is a visualization and interpretation of that that uh, presents it in a way that they can understand and have informed decisions on. So we also committed to create a smart island visualization for the end of the year as well. And finally, as we look to use this uh, platform to encourage tech trials to come to the island, we look to attract two partners to the island to test their innovative products here as well. So I think an uh, incredibly uh, interesting project, somewhat different from some, some of our other areas, but uh, I think with a huge potential and something we can really go a number of different directions um, as we look forward. I'm now going to invite Sarah back to stage, this time wearing a different hat as a skills project manager uh, within the agency. Um, she's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, how we're going to make more skilled workers available to the Isle of Man businesses. I should have actually brought a different hat or a different jacket. <laughs> that would have worked well. So I've already introduced myself in the context of IoT. Just to explain why I was so keen to get involved in the digital skills strategy, learning and development is another passion of mine. I actually started out in HR many years ago with responsibility for arranging training courses, supporting technical managers in how to make the use of their budgets, plan career development paths and succession planning. And I was also lucky enough to complete several CIPD modules whilst in that role too. My career path did change when a dream job came up to help run and set up Manxnet. But time and time again throughout that and many other areas I've worked in, I have sought out and relished the opportunity to develop training material, which was always aiming to demystify complicated technology for non-technical audiences. From early guides of how to get online, um, from teaching people how to use mobile phones up at the college, and a Manx Telecom and Live at Home initiative to teach older people how to use iPads, and many others. And of course, really importantly, when I gained people management responsibility, that I took that really seriously and tried my best to help the team thrive and grow in the way that suited them best. And in the wider community context, becoming a parent makes you rethink your own career choices and the way that your, your life fell. So I wanted to think about how I would support my children in terms of extracurricular choices, on through to careers advice, helping them decide their options and beyond. So before I move on, another little bit of a definition, we always have to do this. So what do we mean by digital skills? 
One of the favorite definitions that I found, a range of abilities to use digital devices, communication applications, and networks to access and manage information. They enable people to create and share digital content, communicate and collaborate, and solve problems for effective and creative self-fulfillment in life, learning, work, and social activities at large. So it's quite a big topic. We as an agency want to work with industry and the other government departments and third sector organisations, as well as encourage our whole community to think about this, to understand our situation and creatively work together to minimise the impact of digital skills gaps and allow more of us and our economy to thrive. So with our objective in mind, to ensure that there are more skilled workers available to Isle of Man businesses. There are so many factors to consider. Some that are specific to us here on the island, but most that are global. So that demand for skills, for digital skills in particular, is a global challenge. Here on the island, the digital sector is growing rapidly and there is accelerating digital transformation in every sector and pretty much every area of life. So for our people to thrive in a connected economy and society, digital skills must be prioritised alongside literacy and numeracy skills, as they are now already a key life skill. In this word cloud are many technology types, already moving from the niche or the new into the mainstream. And you can see the overlap here with my subject matter, Internet of Things, also big data analytics, machine learning, AI, all related. It is all interlinked, and it can be dizzying to see how quickly our fourth industrial revolution is changing our daily lives, both in and out of work. So we know things are moving ever more quickly. The rapid changes in technology aren't likely to slow down. And that word cloud was from the Future of Jobs survey from the World Economic Forum, which I find a really interesting read. They go into quite a lot of detail about the jobs that are likely to be automated, and therefore where demand is declining and which of the jobs and skills and technologies we can foresee are already growing in demand. Another great source, if you want to get your finger on the pulse, LinkedIn, obviously have access to a lot of information about companies and, and careers and jobs. So they, they publish their reports. And from one year to the next, looking at the top skills and demand, it changes completely. So they said in 2018, cloud computing was number one, whereas in 2020, that had already changed to, changed to blockchain. However, it's not only traditionally technical or IT-related skills that are in demand. A lot of jobs in every sector require digital competencies, as well as the soft skills like teamworking, critical thinking, communication and leadership. More than ever before, all students need access to relevant, up-to-date advice on how to future-proof their education, aligning their chosen area of study alongside skills development and thinking about those that are required in the workplace. Another report I like to read, the Learning and Work Institute's research revealed that 70% of young people expect their employers to invest in teaching them digital skills on the job. But only half of those employers surveyed at that time felt able to provide that training. So there is some mismatch in expectation and, and whose responsibility are some of these areas which is why I'm so keen that everybody thinks about this and works together. I was really pleased to be able to join the Economic Re Recovery Group, ERG, Our People Workstream, made up from a fantastic and diverse group of people representing many areas of government, education, university, industrial relations, DfE, social security, job centre and many more, coupled with excellent industry representation. And the high level objective for that work stream was to create education, training and work placement opportunities to offset potentially high unemployment from the pandemic. And there were a long list of achievements from that team, some of the most notable being the success of the restart scheme, extended number of courses and places at UCM, an intern scheme, an extended graduate programme and many others. We wrote a paper to the ERG board focusing in on one of our ideas to develop a pilot for a digital literacy training programme. And we were delighted to, delighted to have been awarded our first 300 places. And thanks to a rapid uptake since its recent launch in September, 
the Digital Board have recently approved funding to extend that out to 600 places. So before I move on, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about one of the fundamental pillars of support required in our aspiration for maximum digital literacy, and that is digital inclusion. We really don't want to leave anyone behind. I don't know if you knew or not, I didn't until recently, that the Isle of Man government are actually the chair for one of the British Irish Council work sectors, and that's for digital inclusion. So I've been working alongside colleagues in the Cabinet Office to ensure alignment and to support their policies and plans. For example, they're currently working on a project to launch an assisted digital space, also known as the Get Online Room, in the Welcome Centre at the C Terminal, and to train up their team as digital champions so we can better support people who may not have access to computers and internet connection or indeed the ability or confidence to access services online. And I look forward to sharing more on that next year. And of course, to allow that our digital literacy training programme can be delivered there too, alongside other community hub locations that are being trialled at present. I've also been asked to attend and support their symposium next September. So if this is a topic of interest to you, please seek me out so that we can share ideas and I can feed them in. I'm also looking forward to the census results next year. We need up-to-date figures on the numbers of people that are connected to the internet. We need to fully understand factors that are currently excluding people, whether that's financial, accessibility, motivation, lack of skills, or other. And we need to work closely with the experts, particularly those in the third sector, to make sure we know how best to reach everyone and the most appropriate tactics and pathways to offer support, whether that be practical or financial. As already mentioned, it's great to see in our new island plan that one of the pillars is outstanding lifelong learning and development opportunities for all. So as already mentioned, it's a global challenge, but we are especially concerned that it may have a disproportionate effect on our economy, given the significance of the tech sector to our GDP. We've talked about some of the factors that will continue to increase this gap if we don't work together to make changes and do things differently. So having conversations like this and considering how best we can all play our parts as government, as education, as employers and industry experts, as training providers, as parents and citizens will be critical to innovate and support each other through this. I have the ab absolute utmost respect for teachers and their job is already hard enough without this ever rapidly changing world. So we do need to think about how we can work together to support them, help them keep pace, but we need to also listen to their expertise and understand how we can most usefully help them. And we need to feed them with information about our local, local labour market as well. Some organisations are naturally more open to change and new ideas, but even us in the tech space, we can struggle to keep up or pivot to try something new if traditional recruitment is taking too long or failing. And that's a topic we'd like to explore in a little bit more detail in a breakout session we have at 2.30 in the chapel room. So if that's of interest to you, please join us. The pandemic has had an effect on all of us. And it has made people rethink what is important to them. And for many, it might have been the first experience of working from home and the flexibility that that can give you in your work and life balance. So we need to think about the opportunities about emphasising benefits beyond just the financial we need to embrace new ways of delivering skills training and looking to work more closely with industry to understand our specific local needs and how we can most effectively develop rapid upskilling programmes and ones that can be flexibly delivered. After all, people are already in full-time work or education or perhaps they have caring responsibilities or volunteering responsibilities. We need to make it as easy as possible for people to access this. We need to keep working with the amazing Locate team to make sure we're telling a unified story about how great it is to live and work here. I'm not sure if you saw the recent Telegraph article highlighting our investment in public art, the beautiful murals that have sprung up thanks to the Arts Council, and how that reflects so well on our involving island and environment, perhaps becoming that a bit more attractive again for younger people to stay here or to return after studying off island, or indeed to attract other people to join us here. 
So we mentioned the digital literacy training course before. I would urge anybody um, who feels that they need a bit of a refresher on the Microsoft Office applications to, to consider signing up. I actually genuinely learned an awful lot when I did it. I thought I was great, but <laughs> there's always room to improve. Um, and then the other sort of things that we've been working on recently, I attended the employment and skills event at the Villa Marina. And it was absolutely fascinating to talk to sixth formers and um, I think people choosing their GCSEs. And when you can spark ideas, so I was talking to them about e-gaming and e-sports and being able to connect on that level, whereas I'm a gamer myself. Um, and you can see the lights in their eyes when they understand the wealth of exciting opportunities out there for them. I don't think we tell those stories well enough, so I'm hoping to get together a career story hub. Again, you, know, you guys are going to be able to feed into that with some great stories and try and attract more people into our amazing sector. So thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. As I said, we have a breakout session at 2.30 in the chapel room. Um, or, of course, just find me throughout the day. I'd love to talk to you about either IoT or digital skills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think we can all see there's some genuine passion from Sarah around uh, both IoT and skills. Um, we're lucky to have someone uh, driving this forward with that much passion. Um, so it is a complex area. Uh, we are looking to obviously create more skilled workers and make them available to the, the Isle of Man businesses, um, which takes on uh, a raft of, of different focuses. As we go through 2022, I expect we will be working more closely and collaboratively across the entirety of government to uh, focus on this issue. Um, but we will be, in the early 2022, running a skills campaign uh, to attract digitally skilled workers to the Isle of Man. Um, that will be focused uh, heavily around uh, the e-gaming workforce and uh, some of the shortfalls we understand after having done a survey across the e-gaming sector earlier this year. There are certain target markets that we know we can uh, yield good results from for that as well, but it still wouldn't take quite a lot of effort and different people working together to make that uh, benefit worthwhile. Digital literacy we've touched on a couple of times. Um, we want to see at least 500 people qualified from that uh, through next year. If uptake continues the way it has been, we may even have the opportunity to provide more or to evolve that course to increase another level. Um, this has been uh, quite a new initiative for us and it's interesting to see what kind of results we get out of it. We're looking to uh, create a, a technical careers hub, which will essentially be a website with centralised resourcing and marketing for next year. So people have a resource they can go to to understand what's available, what training may be available, and what opportunities may be available here on the island. And we'll also be looking, um, as we look to work with industries around uh, creating lifelong journeys for people um, and doing more training in this space, to present some op uh, op uh, options for incentivizing digital le learning across the sector. We recognize that we need to change the behaviors of businesses and help them, encourage them, and see the benefit from investing in their staff more regularly than perhaps we have been in the past to make sure that we don't make this skills gap any worse. I'm sure there'll be more uh, things that we come up with skills as, say, as we work across this, across government more through the next year, um, but we do look forward to working with you all on this uh, somewhat more in the next year. Now for our final uh, piece of this morning, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce uh, Richard Oliphant, who's our Director of Telecommunications. And he is going to be talking about how we aim to become a world leader in telecoms, which supports the Isle of Man as a special place to live and work. Thanks, Lyle. And uh, I'd just like to add my welcome to that of all the other previous speakers who've uh, been up here today. Uh, and thank you all for attending. It's great to see so many people here just to look and talk about uh, digital skills and the digital environment that we have on the Isle of Man. Uh, as Lyle said, my name is Richard Oliphant. Uh, I have responsibility for policy and strategy in the DfE through the Digital Agency for uh, Telecommunications. Um, I was responsible for the creation of the National Telecom Strategy, uh, and I remain within DfE to see through its delivery. Uh, this was a strategy that was written and uh, was unanimously approved by Timmel back in 2018, 
And what I want to do now is take you through some of the things of why we wrote it uh, and what we've been doing and what we're going to do in the future in this space. Um, I started my career as a network engineer, so I've got a, a passion for technology. Um, I want to make sure that everyone has access to that technology should they want to access it. Um, I've been in the business now for about 28 years, though you wouldn't recognize from my boyish good looks that that would be the case. Um, previous to working in telecoms, I worked for the government's technology services. Uh, I was running some of their contracts uh, within that agency before moving into DFE. Um, and this infrastructure, as I say, will give you an update on where we are in this particular field. You'll notice on this particular update that it's slightly different from some of the other uh, updates that you've received today. What we tend to deliver is underground infrastructure. We're looking at cabling, undersea cabling, uh, the national broadband plan, whereas some of the previous speakers have been talking about particular sectors and how they might support job creation. We're really the underlying infra infrastructure that helps support and uh, gives the building blocks for those uh, sectors to thrive. Now, the slide behind me shows some of the key highlights and key milestones that we've achieved over the last three years through the National Telecom Strategy. It's a journey that actually started back in 2016 when uh, the then DED, Department for Economic Development, commissioned a report in telecommunications and the uh, environment for telecoms on the island. But at that time, there was no real resource within government to actually grab that and drive some of those initiatives and make a change. So on that basis, the Chief Minister back in uh, 2017 highlight, gave four MHKs the job of forming a committee, uh, Mr. Ashford, Dr. Allenson, uh, Ms. Betterson and Mr. Perkins. They went out and talked to the local businesses, they talked to the operators, and they came forward with a report that looked to move policy forward in this particular area. Now, one of the key recommendations from that report and from that committee report was that resource should be committed uh, and, and put into this sector to try and help drive it forward. Uh, they just said that the national telecom strategy should be commissioned and it should be brought before Timble for approval and for debate. That's why I was brought in to try and create that national te <coughs> telecom strategy. Uh, it looked at six key themes and 22 specific actions. It gave a clear direction of travel for the next five years for our telecom industry. Um, it was approved, as I say, back in October 2018. Now, we don't obviously have time within this session to go through every single element uh, on the board behind me or, in the, indeed, the National Telecom Strategy, but I will be around all day, as will all the other speakers. Uh, do please feel free to grab me, uh, grab me either this afternoon or this evening. I'm happy to talk to you about any element of the National Telecom Strategy or the National Broadband Plan. Now, as I mentioned, the strategy covered six key themes. Now, the first theme was around resource. As we've seen previously from previous reports, if it doesn't have the right resource, then these things won't move forward. Now, it might not just be people. It could be access to cash. It could be access to other infrastructure that government owns and manages. And the theme, the theme one really looked at how those elements could help drive and, and complete the strategy and move it forward. Theme two looked at regulation. It's obvious that we've, and we've noticed from a lot of regulatory conversations today that the regulator has a real power and levers that it can use to help uh, make a strategy successful. So we've been working with Cura uh, quite a lot over this and facilitating a lot of changes and implemented a lot of changes in this particular area to help our strategy. This includes broadband advertising uh, and they've been focusing on investment and competition as well over the last two or three years. Theme three was a major part of the strategy and that was the National Broadband Plan and I want to come a little bit back onto that later in this talk just to highlight a few more air parts of that strategy. Theme four highlighted the need for undersea cables. Um, both the committee and the National Telecom Strategy identified the island should have new cables both east and west of the island uh, to connect us to the wider world networks. Theme five looked at identifying planning uh, and associated legislation that can have a real dramatic effect on the operator's ability to install new infrastructure and how policy can influence changes in that legislation and how would that facilitate and enhance the operator's infrastructure and networks. The last theme of the strategy looked at government's infrastructure itself and in particular it focused on Ellen. Ellen is a wholly owned subsidiary of the MUA. Uh, they own and manage a lot of on-island and undersea fibre assets. How could they support and facilitate the National Broadband Plan? So if I return back to the main part of the strategy, that was the National Broadband Plan. This is the policy and the plan to try and drive fibre across the whole island for those that should wish to access it. If we look at the UN, uh, the Broad Broadband Commission of the UN has tasked all 194 member states to have fully formed and fully government-backed national broadband plans by 2025. 
they recognise, as do we, that uh, high quality broadband and internet access is an enabler for economic growth and for social inclusion. Broadband services are no longer a luxury item. They're a must for our businesses, for our government to deliver its services, and for all of us to get online. Both the Chief Minister and the Council of Ministers believe that the government had a key role in actually helping enable this for everybody on the island. If we look at the USA, Joe Biden has just committed $100 billion to help bring internet access to 42 million rural Americans who have little or no stable access to the internet. This is the only, this is the only infrastructure projects in the US that outrank that are roads and bridge schemes in the US, so they're putting a huge amount of uh, emphasis on this. And in this respect, we're ahead of many of those nations. We aim to pass 99% of the island's premises with fibre by the end of 2024. And indeed, the Economic Recovery Group allocated additional funds to reduce the rollout time from five years to four years and to get past 75% of the homes within three years. We can see from nations that have already rolled out their national broadband plans that the underlying infrastructure doesn't really get talked about anymore. It's just there and it just works. And this is the position we want to find ourselves in. We want to be talking about the services that sit on top of that infrastructure rather than worrying about the infrastructure itself. So to that end, the uh, department ran a, a tender exercise back in the end of 2019 into 2020 to help deliver these goals and to deliver a national broadband plan. Contracts were signed with Manx Telecom back in 2020, July 2020, and by August this year, we'd managed to pass 50% of the island's premises. We're currently approaching 55%. If we look back at theme four, this was concerned with undersea cables. These undersea links are estimated to carry 99% of the global traffic, data traffic around the world, with the satellite picking up the 1% to 2% that's left over. These cables connect our island to the outside world for telephone calls, internet services, banking services, e-commerce, social media, communication and shopping. They are a vital part of our communications infrastructure. The Isle of Man is currently served by five undersea cables. We have two BT cables, we have two Vodafone cables, and we have Ellen's cable, who I mentioned earlier. The BT and Vodafone cables are approaching 30 years old, and it's why the committee and the National Telecom Strategy highlighted we needed to do something in this space and bring new infrastructure to the island. Now, the department's been working very closely with a company called Aquacoms. They are, or have, brought two new cables to the Isle of Man. Uh, it's part of their Celtic Connect network. These cables were laid into Port Erin and into Port Grenier. And over the last 18 months, you may have seen a boat in the waters, a boat called the Eel de Bats, that's been laying these cables out into these beaches. You may have seen the beaches being dug up, certainly in Port Erin. These new cables are providing new connectivity links to the USA through Ireland, into New Jersey, and through to Europe via the UK and Newcastle. Now, all, island, all these parts of this cable are now installed on the island, uh, and they should be live by early next year. This includes a new connection point on the island, a new point of presence, where new local businesses and operators can connect and get access to these networks. Other parts of the strategy we've been completed uh, include working with the regulator Cura on their approach to post-national broadband plan uh, regulation and how they would view and manage this going forward, given the government invention, intervention in this area. We supported work with Cura on changes to the structure of their board to remove the political chair. We've worked with the Planning and Cabinet Office in the introduction of new legislation with the delivery of new permitted development orders which went live in January 2020. This work provided a clear structure and framework for the installation of new telecoms equipment. We've also supported and worked with the OFT and Cura on the introduction of new broadband advertising guidance. And finally, we continue to work with Ellen and the MUA on how it might support and help deliver the National Broadband Plan. For a good example of that, Manx Telecom and MUA have signed into agreements to share telegraph pole infrastructure to minimise the need for new telegraph poles in areas where these already exist, and especially in areas where cables are buried. This will reduce the need for several thousand telegraph poles across the island over the coming years. Now, before I move on and pass over to Peter, who's going to give some details from Max Telecom, we get asked a lot as part of the National Broadband Plan how we build out the network and, and can we focus in on specific areas around the island and prioritise certain areas. Now, the Island Man network is built out from six core nodes. Those six core nodes are based in two in Douglas, one in Port Erin, one in Port St Mary, Ramsey and Peel. Now, it's where we deliver these new large core fibres that spring their way around the road across major routes, determines how quickly we can roll out the network. We've attached to major routes and roads, and then we splice those cables off 
into the areas where businesses and residential properties exist. It's the speed at which we can lay those cables determines how quickly we can get the fibre to your home. Um, and it also means to, means to make sure that it's the most efficient route to give us the qu quickest delivery times. We're sometimes asked if we can particular, uh, prioritise a particular area. Uh, it's a bit like building a house. It's a bit like trying to put the roof on first so you can build the walls and keep yourself dry. It's pointless rolling the fibre out to a particular residential area if that core network hasn't reached you yet because you'll have nothing to connect to. So we could fibre a particular area. It would be pretty pointless. We have faced challenges along the way in the first 12 to 18 months. Uh, we found blocked ducts, we found buried cables, we found collapsed and inaccessible pavements, uh, we found services in the pavements that we didn't know were there. Uh, all the type of things you probably would expect from a major infrastructure project. Um, we're passing every premise on the island, we're going down virtually every road, uh, but despite these challenges we still remain on time and on budget. Now if I look to what we're planning next, we're continuing to review and work on enhancements to legislation and regulation in support of uh, new and enhanced telecommunication services. We're particularly interested in the new communications bill that's coming forward from Cura. It's reached royal assent uh, and we expect the day orders uh, before the end of the year. And we're really interested to see how that legislation is going to change and enhance our opportunities and change the landscape of uh, operation, operators on the island. We want to continue to support the undersea cable industry uh, and work on ways to exploit that infrastructure for the benefits of our current businesses uh, and to attract new businesses to the island. As the National Telecom Strategy evolves and we complete all the actions that are contained within it, what does the next steps look like? What does National Telecom Strategy 2 need to look like? What initiatives should we be focusing on and what are the challenges we might help to address in the next three to five years? Most importantly, we're really to keep the pressure on Max Telecom to deliver the National Broadband Plan, which we will hope to complete by the end of 2024. The rollout will become more complex and difficult as we start to move away from those uh, urban areas into the more rural areas. Uh, and I'm sure we'll find more difficulties and challenges as we get out into those particular parts of the island. Lastly, but most importantly, how do we exploit this new modern infrastructure, these new undersea cables, this new fibre network? How do we take a full advantage of these enhanced networks? How do we create a data proposition that is compelling, encourages innovation, and encourages businesses to come to the island? These are some of the challenges and things that we're going to be working on over the coming years. And on that note, I'd like to hand over to Peter from Max Telecom. Now, Max Telecom are going to take you through some of the work that they're doing in this space and how they're supporting uh, digital agency in its rollout of the National Broadband Plan and the National Telecom Strategy. So, over to you, Peter. Morning everyone. Um, as Richard said, I'm Peter Callow and I'm Head of Wholesale and Regulation at Manx Telecom. I have the heady responsibility of taking you in that last five minutes to your coffee break. It's a responsibility I take very seriously so I won't, I won't delay too much. Um, I'm here mainly to talk about, as Richard said, the important role Manx Telecom has in the rollout of infrastructure and also give you an update on where we are in terms of both National Broadband Plan and the wider uh, fibre rollout for the island. I have to warn you, before I click the next button, it's quite a bright slide. The beautiful digital agency colour palette wasn't shared with me, so this, you know, you may have to back up a little bit for this one. Oh. Um, some points on this slide have already been made by earlier speakers, so I won't dwell on it, but I will pick up on a couple of points here. So clearly we've talked about the Isle of Man as a leading jurisdiction to locate business and how important that is for the prosperity of the island and many of the businesses that are represented in the room today. The 99% island fibre coverage before the end of 2024, uh, Richard mentioned we're, we're on schedule for that. We're actually ahead of schedule at the moment. And given the challenges that have been faced in the first 16 months of this project, that, that's quite extraordinary because um, COVID's been mentioned a couple of times. It impacted virtually every aspect of the project in terms of bringing resource to the island in terms of the worldwide shortage of some of the key kit, um, in terms of even accessing people's homes to put fibre in. So to be on schedule or a month or two ahead at this point is you know, really tremendous. 
Um, we've also seen the importance of fibre over the last year and a half in terms of people keeping in touch with one another. You know, the world is quite changed now and we take very, very seriously the responsibility we have in ensuring the work-life balance and giving people the tools to work from home where necessary and um, keep in touch with loved ones. For the infrastructure, unfortunately, it takes quite a lot of money to do it. Um, we're incredibly grateful for the government and DfE and the investment in the National Broadband Plan, the 10 or 11 and a half million, depending on how quickly the plan is achieved, um, is essential. There are lots of areas of the island that wouldn't have been economically viable to reach without that investment. And for the Isle of Man to get to 99% within, well, it's going to be less than three years, August 2024 is the target. That puts you on the gold standard of having, you know, one gig available to every household be an incredible thing. Alongside that fibre rollout, Manx Telecom's investing in all sorts of other aspects as well. One thing I will pick up on is the increase in capacity on the network on the island at the moment. Um, we've had a project which has been visible to the public only for about the last eight weeks, which is called the BNG AAA upgrade. But, you know, I'm not a techie guy. For, for the layman, it's just about putting more capacity and capability and resilience in the on-island network. So if we have a problem, a customer won't experience it. The, the network's capable of, of managing that. Um, by, by luck rather than judgment, that, that program of shifting 34,000 customers over was completed this morning and um, it really puts the island in a great position going forward for having not just a great fibre network rolled out everywhere, but a very robust and resilient one as well. Um, the other thing I'll pick up on, on this slide is the top 10 global ranking, which is a real aspiration for Manx Telecom and wider DFE in the digital agency to achieve. The Isle of Man at the moment is rated 42nd in the world with an average speed of about 52 megabits per second. That's an improvement on where we were a couple of year, years ago. It was about 60th then, so we've got an upward tra trajectory. But the fibre rollout and shifting customers over to fibre is a key part of doing this. To get a top 10 status, you need pretty much over 100 megs per second. And what we're seeing is as customers shift to fiber, they take at least 100 meg service. So it's a real springboard to get us where we need to be. Just as a comparator, um, the Alban's in 42nd, UK is 43rd and Ireland is 44th. So we're not doing too badly, but some jurisdictions where there's been a lot of government funding over the previous years have got to the top of that league table. Moving on to where we are in terms of progress to date. Uh, Richard mentioned the headline figure of 55% um, of total premises passed. But I just thought it would be worth using the last couple of minutes to give you a little bit more detail about how the island's broken down. So there's roughly 42,500 premises. There isn't an exact figure, it changes. There's no source that will tell you an exact one. But National Broadband Plan covers 12,345 of those. The rest of them are around 30,000. We consider commercial fibre rollout. Um, the middle pie shows you the premises passed. And you can see that the pink sector and the blue sector added together. Pink sector is MT responsible. Blue is NBP. If you add those together, you can see now we're at the 55%. This was correct at the end of October. so. We're probably actually about 58% now at the end of November. It's going up at about 1,000 a month. Um, it still leaves a lot of work to do, but that August 2024 target is achievable. And in, in the case of the National Broadband Plan, there's been tremendous progress. In the first 16 months, which is um, a third of the programme, we've, we've achieved 39% of the National Broadband Plan and there's been a take-up of 25% of that with customers connecting. So this investment from the government's really made a difference in, in getting um, fibre out island-wide rather than just in the, the urban areas. The last pie chart is the challenge we've still got because despite the success in rolling it out, we need to get customers over onto fibre. 
the premises past is something of a vanity compared to the reality of all of the advantages and benefits being achieved when customers actually move to fibre. It's more robust, the speeds are quicker, the experience of customers on fibre is 90% positive once they get there. Um, so there's still work to be done on that. There's 17% of all of the premises on the island are now converted to fibre, which is, equates to about a third of where fibre is available. Uh, during the next year, we'll start a programme where conditions are optimal to start moving customers across um, at no cost to themselves onto the fibre. Because the programme's been actually running for three and a half years now. Um, National Broadband Plan's just been the last year, but we're starting to get areas where, where fibre has been established and we've had good take up in those areas. We'll be looking to move them across and you know, really start achieving all these benefits for the island and for all the businesses that are located here. That's all I have to say, but like the other speakers, I'm around all day, and if you have any questions about the fibre rollout programme, the BNG AAA replacement, or anything else that Manx Telecom is involved in, I'd be happy to help. Thank you.